Welcome, everybody, to this meeting of the Finance and Economic Special Interest Group. Uh, I'm chairing it because the the chair is um, wasn't certain of being at the, the right place at the right time with other commitments. And before we welcome our speaker, um, you will have seen that the meeting is being recorded. Um, the only people who will appear as ourselves, uh, as myself and the speaker, unless you choose to speak and show yourself. Um, and um, I can see people are, yes, Lutz has, has reminded everybody about that. So it's in there. Um, so our speaker is Martin Dory, um, who was a, was a pianist, which is perhaps not the more obvious career starting point for somebody who became a fellow of the Institute of Actuaries. And he's particularly interested in financial modeling, bespoke situations and pursuing scientific research. Um, so he's he's done a lot of very creative things, and he's got a very interesting topic, the geometry of fire, finance. And um, he's claiming, which I'm fascinated to learn about, that geometry has been overlooked in finance and statistics. Certainly I know that some of my colleagues, when I was taught statistics a number of years ago, were very good at explaining things in terms of the geometry of the problems that you were solving. So I know some people are very good at uh, seeing things geometrically. Other people might prefer algebra or calculus or such like. Um, so Martin will speak for about 40 to 50 minutes. He said that he's happy for people simply to interrupt with questions if you want or you can accumulate your questions to the end. Um, if you put questions in the chat, I don't expect Martin to look at those, but I will probably keep an eye on them um, and then come back and ask people the questions if appropriate. While um, Martin is speaking, the convention is to keep uh, your camera switched off and your microphone switched off, as I'm sure you all know. Um, and uh, yes, yeah, some of you may have heard I'm uh, having, having an interesting discussion about concepts of self-regulation, which is a completely different topic from the geometry of finance. So now let's launch into the delights of the geometry of finance. Thank you, Martin. Thank you very much, uh, Jane. I'm going to share my screen. I'm also going to turn off my face just to hope that in the hope that, that improves connectivity. So I'm going to turn off my my screen. And I'm going to start sharing. And what I'd like, Jane, is if you could just tell me, it, just confirm that you can see my screen okay and I'll proceed. Yes, yes, I can see it fine. Thanks. Great, thank you. Um, so, um, Dory Financial Modeling, uh, we're a company that's been running since about 2013, November. And our clients are mainly in the uh, private equity space. We also support um, private wealth portfolios. We do a lot of research. And for a small firm, we've got about sort of five, six people. Um, we we do spend a large amount of our, of our revenue uh, just developing technology and also developing fundamental mathematics as well. And what I'm going to sh show you today is a a sort of a small extension of some work that I presented in 2011 to the Institute of Actuaries, and uh, it was very kind of them to make it uh, one of the top talks of. Uh, Sorry, 2000, yeah, 2011, 2012, can't remember now. Um, but um, uh, we use a lot of this thinking in our day-to-day -day work, and we've come up with some very innovative uh, solutions to technical problems. Uh, and we got there through geometry rather than using standard algebra. And um, I think it's worth just... Um, talking about that and that it's not just about doing maths it's also really a question about philosophy and uh Kumar and Venkataswamy uh, recently peer-reviewed some of our work and he said why don't you talk to the um Royal Statistical Society about about this particular piece of work and I said I can't talk about that because it's top secret but what I can do is perhaps offer a talk on the geometry of finance which takes us on to some of our, our more innovative work that we've been doing so here we go. Um, 
let's start by talking about metaphysics and Aristotle. Um, it's said that Pythagoras was really the guy who, who really got a, a proper movement going in Greece onto mathematics. Um, and Pythagoras um, has got a, a sketchy history because on the one hand, people attribute a lot of work to him, but on the other hand, there's, there's absolutely no evidence for it at all. So a lot of what we say about Pythagoras, if you're a cynic, you can say, well, that's total hearsay. He probably had nothing to do with it at all. Um, but actually, he probably did have a lot to, to do with it. And I, my view is that Pythagoras uh, was probably a, you know, a very uh, significant social entrepreneur in the sort of way that, uh, for example, um, Bill Gates at Microsoft or um, or, or even at uh, Apple, um, uh, you've got, uh, so I've got COVID at the moment, so apologies if I'm stumbling over my words. Um, we've got leadership all the way around the world, bringing new ideas, uh, but it's really about um, social entrepreneurship and getting the Greeks interested in mathematics. So the beginning, uh, this is a Pythagorean idea, and it's it's uh, uh, it's called the Monad, and it's basically their thinking was at the beginning of the of the universe, there was probably a singularity, and they represented it like this with a dot with a circle around it. And the significance of the circle is that they believed that God moved in circular ways. And uh, they came up with ideas about the movements of, of, of the heavens and the planets and, and the moon. And they came to the conclusion that uh, circularity seemed to be something that the gods did, but uh, we couldn't really see it here on Earth. And um, uh, I find it amazing that uh, in this day and age, uh, we look at the universe as starting from a a big bang, a singularity. But they also had this idea at the root of all things was was these these singular units, which they called atoms. And it has more than a passing resemblance to the, uh, the image of an atom. This is called the monad. So whilst we can say this is ridiculous and pure cultism, uh, there is a surprising uh, significance to these ideas and, and how we understand the world today. The other thing I'd like to draw your attention to is this monument at uh, Waterloo. It's called Cleopatra's Needle, and it was taken from, uh, I think it was negotiated uh, from the Egyptians, from Alexandria. But Cleopatra actually moved it to uh, Alexandria from a city called Heliopolis. And Heliopolis uh, was for thousands of years the centre of learning for the pharaohs in Egypt. And at that time, um, when this needle existed, um, the entire resources effectively of the civilized world was, was put into learning and study. And they developed ideas of monotheism, worshipping the sun god. And there was a class of priests who were called the Hebrews. And at the same uh, part of the world, they developed schools of learning. And one of the people who attended these schools of learning, again, you can't say with absolute certainty, but it's more than likely based on what we know about Pythagoras was Pythagoras. And he was one of the few Westerners who went to these uh, priesthoods to learn about science and learn about philosophy. And I find it extraordinary that the one remaining remnant of, of uh, this Heliopolis is a few obelisks, one of which stands here in uh, Waterloo, and the other one stands in New York. But the place where this obelisk was built was where religion, as we know it today, was established. And also mathematics and the science of natural philosophy was established. And, and it's, it's, uh, it's touching that uh, on our doorstep is this one ancient artifact that links us to the past. Uh, and it's just ignored. So the idea of the Egyptians was they wanted to measure the earth. And they called it geometry, earth measurement. This wasn't some ethereal desire to understand the cosmos. It was actually quite practical because Egypt had lots of flooding and they really need to understand whose property belonged where after a flood. So understanding how to measure the land was, was actually quite a significant commercial problem for the Egyptians. So they put a lot of resource into it, more than perhaps most people would have had an incentive to because of the flooding. And uh, in uh, around um, sort of, uh, well, beginning in 570, we understand Pythagoras to have been born, but he went to Heliopolis uh, 
at this incredible school where he underwent priest training probably for around 20 years before returning to Greece. And while some people say that he, everything he did was a load of old rubbish, actually it was only 150 years between Pythagoras and Euclid publishing the elements. And depending on uh, what you read, chapters one, two, and four um, are likely to have come from the teachings of the early Pythagorean schools. And we can see that Pythagoreans were involved in senior administrative roles for about uh, 150 years before uh, Euclid uh, developed his, uh, uh, his, his elements, which became the principles for learning for thousands of years following that. Um, so Pythagoras is probably uh, a key social entrepreneur, uh, perhaps an Elon Musk of his time. Elon Musk didn't build the spaceships, he got other people to, but he motivated people to get on and study. Um, so let's move on. The role of geometry in finance comes down to two philosophical ideas. Um, analysis. If you can find an equivalent geometric analogy to the financial problem, often that problem can be solved more easily. And I can certainly agree with that, that sometimes you're trying to solve some algebra and actually that's not the right way to start. It's actually just to find a different perspective, a different set of coordinates where everything makes sense and to do analysis from a different set of distances and coordinates. Then there's this concept of synthesis, which is to apply and integrate several different strategies to solve a financial problem. And I think that one strategy to solve a problem may well be geometry. And I don't think we put enough effort into that. So what are the things that Pythagoras was really teaching to his Pythagorean school? Well, we can see evidence that there was a lot of work on distances and angles. The study of dimensions. How many dimensions are there in the world? Then there's the graphical representation of numbers. Um, and this idea that God moves in a circular way. What is the role of the circular? Uh, the, the circular path. And we can see that the Greeks really kicked off a lot of work into number theory, um, particularly in relation to fractions, what you might call irrational numbers. In Pythagoras' day, they believed that there were boy numbers and girl numbers. When they discovered uh, irrational numbers, suddenly they had these in-betweenies that they didn't really know what to do with. So let's go to a phrase which is often attributed to Pythagoras, which is establish the triangle and the problem is two-thirds solved. <coughs> Excuse me if I mute, it's because I'm, I'm coughing. Uh, but let me present a proof. Um, let's define investment risk. So if you've got two funds, let's call them fund C and fund B. Uh, if I wanted to look at the, the standard deviation of returns between fund C and B, I might look at the daily or the monthly returns and I calculate the difference between them. And then I calculate the standard deviation of them. And it's well established that this can be expressed as the, the risk of C squared, the risk of B squared minus two times the correlation of um, C and B and the risk of C and B. And this is a two-dimensional problem. And it's got C and B other dimensions of this risk framework. But we can add in a third dimension, which is a benchmark. Now the benchmark could be the all share index, or it could be cash, or it could be something which has no risk at all, just call it zero. Um, and what we can do is we can express the returns of C relative to a benchmark, which could be the all share index, the relative returns of B against the all share index, and the covariance uh, term at the end um, of these relative returns and the correlation of the relative returns between C and B. And actually, um, the bit on the left cancels out to take us back to the standard deviation of the difference in returns between C and B again. But now we've got a third dimension, which is A included. So why am I showing you this? It's because I'm trying to establish a three-dimensional relationship, as Pythagoras would say, establish the triangle, the problem is two-thirds solved. And I can rewrite that equation to be the correlation of relative returns looks like this. And on the top, I've got the relative returns between C and B, uh, the relative returns between just C and the index, B and the index, and I've got the C and B against the index on the bottom. Now, this is the cosine rule. And you'll see it's very similar. 
we've got C and B on the top, C and A, B and A, C and A, B and A on the bottom. And it looks almost identical. The other point you may observe is that correlation goes between minus one and plus one. And cos of theta goes between minus one and plus one. So how odd that these two things are so similar. It looks like the cosine rule, and it looks like we're calculating points on a on a triangle. This isn't a right angled Euclidean triangle. This is non-Euclidean triangle where we've got correlation. So the reason for this is there's different proofs. My favorite one is, which I think is most communicable to statisticians at large, is a dot product proof. You've got the angle between vectors is given by this dot product. And that's very well established. And the dot product formula is the summation of basically two vectors where the elements are multiplied by each other. Now Pearson's coefficient uh, has got things that look a bit like a dot product in it. You've got the multiplication of different variables. Um, but in this case, um, correlation can be expressed as the dot product between X and Y tilde, where the data has netted off the means. So if you take off the means from a set of data, you get exactly the same formula as the dot product rule for the cosine because of theta. So they are actually identical. They are the same calculation. And what I'm saying is that angle is actually correlation and length is actually standard deviation. So we're in this bizarre situation where we're all doing statistics and none of us actually realize that we're actually doing geometry um, and that risk and distance are the same thing and correlation and angle are the same thing. And I think it's interesting that since the birth of statistics, they've created geometry without realizing that they are the same thing, one and the same. So how do you measure dimensions? So uh, it's said that one dimension is basically a line. Two dimensions, um, you can form a triangle. And what you've got in a triangle is two sets of 90 degrees. Um, or you could produce a tetrahedron. And here we've got three dimensions. And here I can find two sets of 90 degrees in the coordinates of the points that make up these shapes. So um, how can we analyze how many sets of 90 degrees we've got? And bear in mind the Greeks say, look, if you hold your hand out and have a sort of a your right hand, you've got your thumb pointing upwards, your first finger pointing forwards and your third finger pointing towards you, you can find three sets of 90 degrees. Therefore, we know we're living in a world with three dimensions. And dimensionality and this 90 degrees is, is a very, very important Greek idea. So when correlation is naught, we're talking about uh, two variables which sit at 90 degrees. And when we're saying you've got some investments and they're very correlated, we're saying the angle between them is zero and they're sitting on top of each other and they both move upwards at the same time and downwards at the same time. And when correlation is minus one, we're saying that the angle is again, um, is 180 degrees. Um, but in fact, we're talking about the same dimension, but just moving in opposite in the same dimension. So this is the first point, um, the relationship between correlation and angles. So if you had three uncorrelated assets, you're talking about three dimensions. If you've got three assets, they're going up and down at the same time, you're talking about one dimension. Now, if you're in the investment markets, you may think that you are invested a lot of diversified assets and giving yourself the benefits of having loads of eggs in one basket to protect yourself. It's no good if they all go up and down at the same time. You're effectively holding one asset and one dimension. So how do we measure dimensions? So going back to this idea of the Greeks counting right angles, we can use things like eigenvectors and eigenvalues. And if you run a correlation matrix through, um, uh, you know, all sorts of, you know, commercial software to calculate uh, our eigenvalues, you'll end up with a matrix of rotation and D, which is a scaling and of, of underlying dimensions. So if you take some uncorrelated data, 
you can rotate it and stretch it to form a set of correlated data with a uh, with a standard deviation that you're looking for. So anyone can do this. Take a correlation matrix and calculate the eigenvalues of it. And you will find that if you have two variables with one on the diagonal and a correlation of zero on the off diagonals, and you run your uh, eigenvalue calculation on it, you'll see that D looks like this. It looks like one in the left-hand corner, one in the right-hand corner, and zero on the off diagonals. And this is telling you that the, the dimensions are, are spread between the first and second dimensions equally. Now, if I change my correlation to be one, it's telling me, ah, in fact, you've got two, two of your, uh, your variables are all stuffed into the first, uh, your first dimension, and you're actually not using the second dimension at all. In fact, you've got one dimension used twice over. Um, and what you can do is you can then say, well, let's, um, if you want to count the dimensions, I can take, take the minimum of D and one and sum it together, and that'll give me the number of dimensions. For example, here, I've changed my correlation to a half. And it's telling me now, ah, you've got one and a half loaded into the first dimension and a half loaded into the second dimension. And I would argue that because I've got all of dimension one and a half of dimension two being used, I would say, actually, this is a problem with one and a half dimensions. So this is a continuous measurement of the number of dimensions in a set of data. And in fact, what you can do is you can look at uh, any data set. Here I've looked at, for example, 11 broad um, sectors in the stock market. I measured it from December 1998 to the present day. And I said, what's happening to the dimensions in these 11 sectors? And using this formula, I can say that actually around 1999, on January, I had about five dimensions. And as we got to the bottom of a, a long um, economic decline uh, at the end of 2000, and two, uh, the, the number of dimensions actually went down to close to two and a half. And whenever we've been in a crisis or, or a shock in the markets, the number of dimensions in the UK sectors has gone down to about two and a half. <clears throat> and when the, the markets are in a level of comfort, we can see the number of dimensions in these sectors is about five. So we can see during a crisis, the number of dimensions change in the stock markets. And this is linked to the correlations heading towards one. So how do you visualize changing dimensions? If I've got three infrastructure projects, or with 90 degrees between them because they aren't correlated, uh, if you've got three infrastructure projects, are we saying that we've got a triangle with three sets of 90 degrees? How can you have a triangle with 270 degrees? Should this be thrown in the rubbish bin? And the answer is, it's non-Euclidean. What we're look, talking about visually is a triangle on a sphere. And at each corner of this sphere, you'll see we've got 90 degrees. It's a bit like saying you've got all your money in asset A at the top, all your assets, all your money in asset B at one corner, and all your money and asset C the other. And the sphere's radius is the risk of um, your exposure to these assets. Um, if I had all my assets in asset A, the radius will take me to that point at the top. If I had all my assets in asset C, the risk, the radius, would take me all the, all the way over to, there to C. Now, if they're uncorrelated, they all form the shape of a sphere. If they all have a standard deviation of one, the sphere will have a radius of one. But if the assets are correlated, the sphere will warp into a rugby ball shaped. And if they all move up and down at the same time, it'll form a line. And I'll show you that in a minute. But the other thing to note is that on this corner of the sphere, we're saying that all three assets are positive. Each quadrant refers to the assets either performing positively. And on the other side, if you imagine England being one side of the globe and New Zealand being the other, we find around New Zealand, uh, all three assets had a negative return. And in fact, the 
in reality, when you're looking at the performance of assets, you find the the distance of, of assets from their from their mean will depend on what's happening in the world, and the risk is essentially an, uh, an average. And assets behave differently when they're uh, performing well, and when they're negatively uh, performing, they tend to have higher levels of risk. So, in fact, we're not just talking about a, a sphere; we're actually talking about more of an egg shape where things get more elongated and, and, and uh, longer and more pronounced where there's high levels of risk. So it's not perfectly circular is the first thing I'm saying. So how do we transform a sphere to, to visualize it? What you can do is you can rotate and stretch the sphere by covariance. And to do that, we take uncorrelated points and we multiply it by the square root of the covariance matrix. Typically in my industry, and uh, people use Cholesky decomposition to try to find out the square root of the covariance matrix. Uh, I personally think that's a complete waste of time. In fact, all you need to do is calculate the eigenvalues and, the, and, and vectors, and some functions have that built in. There's a function, for example, in MATLAB called square root m, square root of the matrix, and that uses eigenvalues and, uh, and vectors to calculate the square root. So what I've done is I've taken one quadrant of the sphere and I said, let's measure the dimensions and let's visualize it. Here we've got 90 degrees between each point and there's three dimensions. As I increase correlation, you can see the angles between these asset changes and the number of dimensions go down. If I add in more correlation, it becomes a segment of a rugby ball and the number of dimensions starts to go down quite dramatically. And when there's a lot of correlation, all the correlations go to one, there's zero degrees between them. And I'm dealing with one dimension. And what we see is during an economic crash, the dimensions head to one, fear is taking over. So this is a, an example of looking at the all share index, the corporate bond index, and UK government guilt. And this is actually a visual, geometric visualization actually of these three assets. And you might think you've got three assets, but according to this mass, you're actually only holding 2.4. There's not, not as much diversification as you would hope. So in order to take this forward, I need to return to this Pythagorean idea that God moves into in a circular path. And I'm going to talk about the time. Um, one of my favourite gags is standing up at an actuarial conference and saying, hands up if you do a calculation on a pension scheme every three years. And about a third of the actuarial conference will put their hands up. And I might say, hands up if you do a calculation every year. And all the insurance actuaries will put their hands up and go, yeah, we do reserving every year. And I might talk to the investment attendees and say, Okay, hands up if you do a calculation every quarter. And they'll go, yeah, we do portfolio monitoring every quarter. There might be some high frequency traders who who, who do trading on a, on a weekly, daily, or even on a millisecond by millisecond basis if they're a high frequency trader. But what we're talking about here, milliseconds, days, weeks, months, trainial, we're talking about measures of the calendar clock. Now the calendar clock is based on the Earth's movement around the sun. Now, my question is this, what's the Earth's movement around the sun got to do with investments? And the honest answer is outside of agricultural commodities, absolutely nothing. And yet, in my world, when we measure the performance of assets and their risks, we use measurements of time which are derived from the calendar clock. And um, it's increasingly naive because actually the way things move isn't dependent on the Earth's position relative to the sun. It's actually based on what's happening in the economy. So can we measure economic time? It's quite a cool question. So let's have a think about that. There's some quite fundamental macroeconomic drivers in the world. One's what, what's the Fed doing with its target interest rate? Is it trying to stimulate the economy by lowering interest rates? Or is it trying to um, dampen down economic expectations by raising economic rates? The other thing is what's happening to US unemployment. If unemployment's high, the Fed's going to be under a lot of pressure to stimulate the economy. 
whereas if unemployment's low, uh, people are going to be uh, hard to employ because you're going to have to entice them out of an existing job by giving them more money. And then inflation might take over and you have to control inflationary expectations. And so the Fed's then under pressure to start increasing the uh, the interest rate again. And what you find, and I've shown it from 1998 to the present day, is that there's a cyclical motion between interest rates and, and unemployment. And uh, in fact, you can see that during COVID, there was a rapid increase in unemployment and also a rapid, rapid decrease. I think it's fascinating that if you roll this chart back in time, the rate at which people are unemployed or the gradient of unemployment, I don't know if you can see my mouse here, that gradient of people increasing in unemployment is half the rate at which people are pulled out of unemployment and taken back into the workforce. So that gradient is double that gradient. Uh, and it's actually exactly double. So people lay people off twice as fast at the rate at which they employ them. And um, that was borne out even here. So um, these are macroeconomic indicators. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to put them together. I'm going to take the Fed's target rate and call it X. I'm going to take unemployment, call it Y. And these are normalized, by the way. I've taken the means and divided it by the standard deviation. I'm going to call something the economic cycle, which is X minus Y. Now, the economic cycle goes through periods of boom and heating, and it goes through periods of cooling and bust. And um, these, this orange sort of golden line is my best estimate at what we would recognise as being the economic cycle. Quite often economists, quite often economists um, purely reference um, um, the stock market growth. But this is a very fast, very noisy time series. What we've got here is very slow moving time series. And it clearly shows us the progression of the economy from overheating to cooling. And it's based on how the Fed is responding to the environment in which it sits. And there's another context of unemployment. And it gives us a very stable measure. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to treat this as a, as a wave. I'm going to say, what are the cycles of this wave? And I'm going to take points on this wave. I'm going to say there's a top and there's a bottom and there's movements across it. And I'm going to assign phases of movement to this wave, assuming that it's moving around in an economic cycle. I'm going to take phase angles on this wave. I'm going to look at what's happening to correlation and risk. Now, I've got this phase angle uh, that I'm going to establish. and I'm calculating risk. Uh, over a period, not using a normal formula for correlation, but an adjusted version. If I took all the data, I'd end up with an average correlation. But what interests me is how is at this particular, a, a particular phase of the economic cycle, how is the data affecting, how is its contribution to the overall data set moving things? And what I can do is I can do a correlation given that we're angle the theta. I can look at the XIs in that um, all the data that sits within a particular phase angle, it might be at different points in time, but, but they are at the same phase. I'm going to knock off the global mean. I'm going to take all the, uh, a second data set that I might be looking at, and I'm going to mine off the minus off the global mean as well. One of the errors that I see pretty much everyone in my industry doing is they look at data that exists in a crisis and they calculate the standard deviation of the mean in a crisis and the correlation on the back of that. That's actually the wrong way to do it. What you have to remember is that is the global mean that concerns you, and it's the angles of these extreme events against the global mean, um, not just the mean of the particular data in, in a stock market crash. So you can't use all the formula that's in Excel. You have to use a slightly different approach, uh, as I've illustrated here. And this gives you much more accurate measurements of what's happening during a crash and how the angles are changing. So what I've done here is um, I've measured geometry over these economic angles. And I've looked at equity, gilts and corporates. 
Now, when there's round balls, there's not not that much correlation. And when these balls become rugby balls, they become much more correlated. And when they're bigger, there's more risk. And when they're smaller, there's less risk. What I've done is I've coloured them based on whether equities were falling uh, red. When equities were rising, I've coloured them green. And what I can see over my measurement of, if you like, the economic cycle, I can see there's a very strong correlation that corresponds to an economic clock, where we're in a period of benign economic growth. Uh, we start heading into overheat. Uh, unemployment's low. Interest rates start cranking up. And there comes a point where they bite. And when they bite, uh, businesses fault, or it might be brought on by a crisis, like um, a credit crunch, or it, you know, like the events of 2007. There's many reasons why uh, something might tip the markets over. But um, <clears throat> the generally when the markets are low, um, when there's a big sort of idiosyncratic event, it tends to impact, impact the markets less than if the markets are high. And then when the markets are high, they're very vulnerable to going down. What we can see as we move around the cycle, we have recession, uh, and then the markets start to uh, recover, and we, we head back into growth, and these very high levels of risk start to go down again. So during uh, benign economic growth, everyone's calm, correlations are stable. Uh, but when everyone goes into a, a period of panic, um, risks are high, turns are low, and we cycle around again. So the world doesn't seem to conform to if you like a long-term average with random noise about it. The economic world definitely moves in terms of a cycle. And if I were to compare this analysis with just using the calendar clock, um, there's almost no correlation with the calendar clock at all, none. Um, and if you use a different measure of time, suddenly everything's very, very correlated and everything makes sense. So most of the work that people in my industry do is based on in fact, I say most, I'd say everyone <laughs> does, is based on the wrong unit of time. Here's another look. So I talked about economic time. I'd like to touch on what I'm going to call Euclidean time. So this is a word I've just invented, so apologies if you've never heard it before. In the statistical world, if returns are identically and independently distributed, let's say your returns are additive. So you want to look at the, the, the variance of a set of returns of, of something uh, over T time periods. If it's identically and independently distributed, uh, I'd imagine that everyone on this call is probably familiar with just adding up the variance. And so there is a link between time and risk, uh, which is the variance is T times the, the variance sigma squared. And the standard deviation is sigma root t. And this is very, very commonly used in, in, in my world uh, by going between daily returns to, uh, to, to, to annual risk. And you have to multiply, uh, for example, the standard deviation of your daily returns by square root of 252. And one of the big questions in, in investment is, is how is risk scaling? Is it actually scaling at the square root of t? How can you possibly represent it as anything else? It just doesn't make sense unless you've got things like autocorrelation. But let's look at this in another way. Let's go back to my Pythagorean world. If things are independent, there's zero correlation. And if there's zero correlation, they have to be at right angles and they are different dimensions. So at time naught, the left hand side of this triangle, I'm basically traveling in this direction until I've gone to time one, at which point I've moved on average, one unit of risk. And if I'm now looking at time two, I'm traveling a different dimension. So I'm now traveling up the page to time period two. This is at 90 degrees. And actually, over time two, period two, if I calculated the um, the Pythagorean uh, distance, I get the square root of two times theta. So this is basic Pythagorean mass. So you can get to the same result uh, either using statistics, which requires quite a high level of prior knowledge, to actually just a simple diagram, which hopefully most people can understand. So this is kind of interesting because a lot of the work in finance and statistical work in finance is, is based on 
this idea of um, Brownian motion. And here's a little uh, model, a little snapshot of Brownian motion. And at every point in time, these little points of dust have been buffeted around independently. And whilst you might look at Brownian motion and go, OK, so how do we model this move from, from time period to time period? If you go back to Pythagorean uh, ideas of geometry and, and how many dimensions are in the world, this is to me is actually saying something much more fundamental about the existence of the universe in which we live. Because in the theory of relativity, people like Minkowski had defined space time as a four dimensional surface where you've got X, Y's, and Z's, uh, and you have this notion of time, which is shown as minus T squared. But um, if you look at Brownian motion, this is saying that can't possibly be right, because if you record the movement of something, you can see that time periods are independent of each other. And if time periods are independent against each other, every single time period is at 90 degrees to the time period before. So every unit of time, and as far as I can tell, um, time, the smallest unit of time is a Planck time unit. Um, is a new dimension. So this, to me, means we were actually, bizarrely, just by looking at dust moving around in a Petri dish and uh, ge you know, geom basic geometry, will tell you that actually we're not in a world with four dimensions. Um, we're in a world where the dimensions seem to be created uh, at every interval. Now, I, I actually, this, this is, to me, is extraordinary because we don't think of the world as being, you know, infinite dimensions of time and how can you possibly create a new dimension at this interval so it's much more likely in my, in my view that time is some combination of, of dimensions which are correlated and it manifests itself as time and we might be for example two dimensions where it's vibrating between them creates a creates a, a movement but it's a correlated movement and that would allow something like time to emerge but certainly this 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 idea of space time has been um, four dimensions it just isn't borne out from a simple experiment of the same Brownian motion that we've based our option theory around. So let's move on. Um, I'm now going to expand on this. There was a, a second point in Pythagorean cultism called uh, the dyad, which is two monads joined together and interacting, what you might call tunis. And tunis uh, exists in the world. Uh, in our number theory, you might have fractions. You've got two, two numbers, might be integers, uh, on a fraction, a numerator, and a denominator. Or you might have a, an imaginary number unit where you've got the square root of, 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 of minus one. Um, so paired number systems are, are important, and we don't use them in statistics. If I looked at the behavior of, this is a simulated, it's not real. Um, if I looked at the behavior of two variables, let's call it x1 and x2, I might find it something that you might call an, a banana shape, where one variable has a monthly return of three, which is very, very positive around here. Um, and it seems to coincide with a, a very negative return of x2. So you have negative tail dependency. In the middle, they're uncorrelated, and you could draw a circle around those points. But um, when when there's a very negative return on, on, on X1, it ends up being positively correlated to X2 again. And actually, you see these behaviours in the markets where when people are behaving themselves, the markets tend to be quite benign with low levels of correlation. But people can get carried away with themselves, for example, during a tech boom. And they might sell everything to, to dive into technology stocks. Um, and it, then you see technology stocks doing very well but people selling other assets to invest in technology stocks. And then you have this thing called fear where everyone goes, oh no, we've got a crisis. So they sell tech stocks, they sell everything and they just go hold something completely different like cash. So this is the banana shape is, is, a, is a real phenomenon you see in the investment markets. Well, it's not possible to create this banana shape because the mathematics doesn't allow it because the measurement of correlation only allows for very, very simple shapes. Um, so what I'm saying is, let's 
start by thinking about Sir Francis Galton. He came up with correlation in 1888. And his idea was that there was a continuous uh, relationship in the evolution. His cousin Charles Darwin came up with these ideas. And he tried to measure it using this continuous measure of correlation, a measure of relationship between uh, arm lengths, for example. But um, there was a different set of thinking, which is perhaps it's not just correlation, perhaps dependence is something else. And Gregor Mendel came up with an idea earlier. He came up with this idea that actually the way peas looked seems to be a paired structure. And men and women are based on pairs of genes and great children by combining their genes. We are, paired, uh, we are a paired number system of X and Y genes. And Gregor Mendel uh, really brought up this idea that actually dependent, dependency might not necessarily be a continuous variable, but actually it's probably a paired number system in genes. And I think if Gregor Mendel came up with statistics, he wouldn't have actually started with a single number to, to represent correlation. I'd argue that he'd probably have a number that looks a bit like this. Correlation is actually two things multiplied together. And I know this will be outside of probably most listeners' comfort zone. But I'm going to call something imaginary correlation. And I'm saying that the actual correlation of X and Y can be represented as two um, imaginary correlations multiplied together, which on their own don't mean anything. But when they interact, they create a correlation. And um, there well, are many I systems. We've got about 10 minutes left. Thank you. OK. Um, so my point is correlation doesn't have to be a singular point. It can exist on a line or it can enlist, exist on a surface of manifold. And um, what you can do is you can express correlation as a as a line and you can link variables to it. And um, if anyone's looking back at these files, please go have a look at this uh, a, a PDF that I produced uh, many years ago on actually how you go about creating correlation systems. Uh, which are very different from the ones we use at the moment. And what we've got is correlation expressed as a line. And they interact to create a distribution. And it's depending on, in this case, because it's on the line, at the bottom of the line, uh, I'm calling the line U. When U is zero, this particular variable has a correlation of one. But when U is at one, this correlation falls to zero. And my second variable, follows exactly the same pattern. When you put them together, uh, what you find is that we've got to variables with very positively correlated tail events, but are then not correlated um, as, as, you, as you head off to the, the top right hand side. In fact, you can create any correlation structure you want, um, not just the purely Gaussian structure that we use. So this is an example of multi-dimensional um, correlation. And um, yes, I mean, you could put in a simple version of this and create exactly the correlation structures structures we use today. But you can also create more complex structures which better represent reality. So that's a, a little snapshot at uh, some of our work in the field of the geometry of finance. Thank you. Thank you very much, Martin. Um, fascinating tour through, through the different ideas of what's happening. <coughs> Um, and uh, I mean, I have a question lurking in the back of my mind. But has anybody anybody got a question that they want to either unmute and ask or put their hand up? Because I uh, I don't know if there's a simple answer to this, Martin. But um, I know that what some of the ways of getting more general formats that people use are copulas. Mm. Um, how do how does uh, your imaginary correlation relate to copulate? Yes. So um, basically what you can do, and uh, you'll see examples in in actually the, the paper that I've referenced that was, was written a while ago, is that you can build copulas. And even copulas have generally monotonic correlation where, you know, bad events correlate on the downside. But what I'm saying is, rather than specifying a copula, and then try and solve the correlation parameter. Why don't you start with the correlation and then fit the model around it? And it doesn't, as long as you, you know um, what's, you know, what's causing the behavior and you can use it as a sort of what you might call a conditioning variable, you can create 
any literally any dependency structure you like using this idea of correlation isn't just a, a single point because all these copulation couplers generally it's a single parameter you might have two uh, for example like a t copula uh, bottle gumball correlation uh, couplers etc they're all based on one one parameter but for me this is for me this is going about it the wrong way but why don't you start with dependency and then work out what the copula looks like at the end and you can do it using this approach and actually build the copula slice by slice um, yeah. Good. And um, one of the thoughts that occurred to me as somebody who's not a scientist. So I'm loving, loving the shot of Tom over there. <laughs> um, is that, isn't one of the implications of what you've said that you can't hedge? Ah. Uh, or it's going to be very difficult to hedge. That's I think mean. difficult to hedge is, 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 the, is the first hedge. point. And actually hedging using a single parameter is just a nonsense. Mm -hmm. It's the world clear, I hope from what I've showed you, that the world isn't explained uh, by a single, you know, monad, a single singularity as a representation of correlation. And that's why I, I yes, I have reservations about uh, the attempt to see some of the attempts to use summary measures and making decisions on mm. on financing things. Um, yeah. you, when you ought to have a yeah, possibly where are, an explicit discussion. Where are we in the economic cycle? What's changed now? How might it change in the future? What are the prevailing risks? What if an idiosyncratic event happens? How's it going to hit us? What if there's a change in the macroeconomic, more systematic risks? And you, you, the point about an idiosyncratic event is you don't know where it's going to hit you, but you can see clearly a broader systematic effects as well, and you're more vulnerable to a crash when you're at the top of the economic cycle than when you're at the when you when you're down, people can kick you, but you can't get any further down than the floor. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you. Um, have we got other? I, I see there have been some thanks in the in the chat. Um, do you have any other comments and questions? Goodness, being a ah, Bernard Bernard Torsney. You want to unmute and speak? You haven't unmuted. You want to speak, Bernard? Or are you having difficulty unmuting? Hello? Ah, good. Hi, uh, Bernard. Uh, hi. Um, could this theory, it was very uh, impressive, uh, could it be applied in other different areas? Yeah. So, in, I, I was actually saying to Jane earlier, we, we've actually built a cash flow model um, which creates a stochastic model without actually needing to do a stochastic model. And I'm very grateful to Kumar and Venkateswamy for peer reviewing that work. And it, it gives exactly the same, I say exactly, as good as numbers as, as a log normal distribution. Uh, oh. uh, without actually having to do any similar. So one of the, for example, one of the challenges is uh, things like pound cost averaging. And what we found is we can create a formula using, based on it, entirely geometry, that gives us exactly the same result as log normal simulations without needing to do any simulations at all. And we can control things like mean reversion by con controlling the, um, the curvature. <laughs> and um, it's extraordinary. And I am sure that you could get rid of uh, uh, supercomputers for weather forecasting uh, <laughs> by using the same, uh, I don't know, but I, my gut is telling me, look, people told me that this was impossible. So the fact that we've done it means you can probably apply it to other areas and weather forecasting is an obvious one. We have to do millions of simulations and follow the paths or, or variables. And where this is just. Mm. <laughs> Great, very interesting. Thanks, Ben. Um, so maybe we need to put Martin Dory in touch with some people like John T. Rougeau, who uh, um, has spent a lot of time trying to uh, uh, bring some more statistics into some of the simulations that are done. Do we have any other questions? Oh, we've got a, about a minute left. I'm certainly going to point people when, they, when the talk's available. Um, I can think of a few people I should point in the direction of 
uh, listening to this and thinking about it. Uh, so I've, I've certainly appreciated it. Thank you, thank you, Jane. If there was one message I would I would have is when we when we're doing our, our work, we often just sort of concentrate on, if you like, just sort of the mass that's in front of us. But what I've learned since my career in 1996, and it was impressed on me, but certainly if, uh, one particular individual was a boss who used to kick me every every week for not thinking radically enough. Was that actually our work is inseparable from philosophy? <laughs> yes. I'm afraid I think that uh, unfortunately the, the the ethics side of philosophy seems to have uh, taken rather a back seat recently. Yes. <laughs> but yes, lovely, thank you. Well, shall we say thank you in the usual way in the last minute? Uh, if you want to unmute or just use the uh, other things or put a comment in the chat. Um, thank you very much, Martin. I'll probably drop you an email with uh, one or two other comments and highlight your work to other people. Great. So thanks very Thank much. Thanks very much, Jane. All the very best. Bye.